Okay, whoops, went too far. Okay, well, thank you for your introduction and also thank you for allowing me to speak at my first conference. So hi everybody, my name is Sophia Abidi. As just said, I am a, a PhD candidate uh, at the University Sorbonne Nouvelle in Paris 3. And uh, I'm going to present to you today my um, paper that I submitted for this conference uh, titled Sex, Drugs and Parties the reshaping of uh, young people's nightlife's leisure and risky behaviors in Berlin during the pandemic. Um, so this paper fits into my PhD research, uh, which draws on youth studies on um, urban sociology, night studies and leisure studies like hedonism and also British civilization. Um, so this research focuses on um, young British and Australian people living in Berlin. Uh, and their relationship to drug use, to techno subculture, to um, their cultural identity. Um, and so, in order to have a, it's in order to have a deeper understanding of these young people's leisure um, behaviors and how it might be correlated with their cultural identity. So, the idea for this paper that I'm presenting you today came to me uh, very early in the, in the pandemic, uh, in March 2020, as in Germany, I guess also throughout the whole world, um, governments decided to shut down uh, clubs, restaurants, bars, and also cultural spaces. Um, I therefore asked myself, assuming that young people usually consume drugs or partake into uh, hedonistic behaviors in clubs and bars, once you remove the physical um, establishment of nightlife entertainment, then what stays and what changes? So in other words, how did the COVID-19 pandemic and its multiple regulations affected the social and personal life of these young people? So I saw there um, an opportunity uh, to that I couldn't miss. So I took the questionnaires that I had already written for my PhD research and simply added a load of section at the end, uh, mainly focused on the COVID-19 impact on the social life and personal life of these young people um, and on their habits, of course. So just a little bit of methodology here. For this paper, I relied on the findings and on the data of my research, but also I managed to gather up to 15 um, interviews um, which include uh, interviews of six people, uh, six British people and nine Australian people. I managed also to get those interviews quite diverse when it comes to the ethnicity, the sexual orientation, the gender identity, the social, economical, or even academic background, which I thought was uh, relevant also for these studies. Um, and uh, the, those uh, interviews were held via Zoom, uh, or your face to face, depending on the regulations at the time, from uh, March 2020 up until August 2021. Each interview lasted between 30 minutes and up, up to 75 minutes, depending on uh, how much the person had to share and if the interview was fluid. And it was really interesting to give them general questions regarding this topic and sort of let them expand on the matter um, as freely as they wanted. It, it is important to mention that all of the names of the study have been modified obviously for anonymity and I also have, I have collected from each um, participants a consent form signed um, to protect their data. And finally, um, each interview have, have been described uh, and analyzed according to standards, to the standards of qualitative social research methods. So by speaking to young people at events or on social media, or also simply by word of mouth, uh, a few volunteers accepted to participate with a real interest and excitement about this topic. And as sensitive as this topic is, drugs and hedonism, um, it was wonderful to see so many young people generally enthusiastic to, about this subject and wanting to share the experience. Um, some of the participants work in nightlife sectors or others are artists and for most of them, uh, they're just uh, uh, people that um, thought that they found that their experience as consumers would be worthwhile to be shared. And so I'm very thankful for them to, to do so. So from this research, uh, three points seemed relevant to me. So the impact of, uh, on the type of drugs consumed and the increase of consumption of drugs during COVID-19, uh, the alternatives found during the pandemic to sustain a form of social life and uh, the solutions needed to be found for a post-pandemic future. So 
When it comes to the impact on the type of drugs consumed and the irregularity of consumption, as people stayed, stayed at home, um, mainly it had been uh, mentioned from most of the participants that the types of drugs has changed as well. Um, by those, so as I'm, I'm, I wrote on the on the keynote, we can name cocaine, psychedelics, and ketamine. These are drugs that were mainly used and mainly uh, mentioned in small gatherings or alone, as in with housemates or with close friends. And when later on in summer 2020 or in summer 2021, when the weather was kinder and there was more illegal raves, bunker, open airs, and sex parties, social drugs such as GHB, GBL, MDMA or speed, which is an informal name for amphetamines, uh, were often mentioned mention uh, from the young participants. It is also important that these latter drugs are often used uh, in Ken sex fueled uh, sex parties, um, which also could be interesting to note because, um, the, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, now, as well as the change in types of drugs, there's also has been a change in the regularity of the consumption of drugs for most of the participants. Um, indeed, 100% of the participants noticed an increase um, of their drug, their drug use and the drug pattern um, out of boredom or habits or simply escapism. And for some of them, it has been a source of anxiousness, a short, sort of guilt as well, uh, related to in regards to their own drug use, potential addiction or drug related access but also of the ones of their friends, of uh, people that they're witnessing um, overdosing around them at parties. And uh, by that, I have a quote uh, from one of the participants who that find really interesting. Um, Sonia said, my friends and I are fine because we know our limits and we don't want to put ourselves in a situation where we need to be looked after. But for others, it scares me. One day I will see somebody collapsing and dying in front of me because of drug use and it will traumatize me forever. It is interesting and important, I would say, to note, and I didn't write in, in the keynote, that uh, out of the 15 people I've interviewed, one of them is a non-binary and three of them are women. And even though the, none of these people know each other or um, collaborate with one another, uh, they all these four people mentioned that same uh, worry about uh, other people not looking after themselves and the increase of drug related accidents in uh, illegal raves. Uh, I thought it would be worthy to mention this. Now, when it comes to the alternatives uh, found during the pandemic to sustain a form of lifestyle, 100% of the participants interviewed have attended, I've mentioned, and attended to multiple illegal raves or house parties since the summer of 2020 as um, only a portion of the clubs of the city managed to open their outdoor areas when other clubs um, had to temporarily shut down. Um, there, there were therefore a sort of um, a competition between legal open airs and regulated open airs and illegal events. And um, so, for example, I made this little graph here where we can see that um, there would be the choice for young people between going to illegal raves and illegal parties, there will be a drastic difference when it comes to the price, when the legal, illegal rave would be free, when the legal event would be from 10 to 25 euros. Um, when it comes to the rules regarding social distancing or um, face, co uh, face coverings, um, none of those rules will be applied at illegal raves and both of these rules will be applied at regular, uh, regulated and legal uh, open airs. And finally, when it comes to the length of the event, an illegal rave or party would last from 12 12 hours up to 24 hours and mainly overnight and a legal event would be daytime only from noon up until 10 p.m. So these are um, considerable um, factors for young people to decide, for the participants to decide to go to illegal raves and parties, which were mainly organized by their friends, by artists that they know, or simply by word of mouth or simply also on social media. Um, and now I also in my paper have, the, uh, have used the study case of um, organizing a sex party during the pandemic by collecting the uh, really insightful testimony of a, um, a DJ and party organizer 
pre-corona that decided during corona to uh, work with her partner and uh, organize a sex party and uh, it was really insightful to understand her process of interviewing the participants and their st attempt as much as they could to uh, respect the regulations uh, put in the at least in the city of Berlin having a maximum of 30 people per night um, and when the maximum should, uh, it was uh, 50 people and also requiring a proof of recovery um, or vaccination or a negative test taken on the same day. Uh, they, I think, performed only two or three three i think uh, as of next week um sex parties since the summer 2020 and waited as much as they could for uh, appropriate period of time to avoid being a cluster so as we can see party organizers and young people had uh, to be creative they wanted to maintain some form of some form of social uh hedonistic and and uh, personal lifestyle and also we could say uh, that it would be similar for clubs as well um, and so my last point will be the solutions needed for a pand uh, post-pandemic future. During the pandemic, young people were easily demonized by governments or by media coverage. I'm assuming that we've all, we've all see, uh, seen a headline of a newspaper um, mentioning young people being the source of a cluster um, in some waves and whatnot. So um, this process entertains an image of a youth being selfish lacking of responsibility, um, therefore distrust and feeling of ungratefulness from young people towards governments and the media has been mentioned often uh, throughout the interviews. And as the nightlife sector is now slowly reopening, it has been proven over the pandemic that culture and nightlife industries are extremely viable to society sorry, to society and also to the economy. And so post-pandemic solutions need to be implemented, such as reinforcing trust and dialogues between young people, members of the nightlife and policymakers, or immediately finding long-term solutions for um, clubs and cultural space, uh, places uh, to plan a living with COVID present and future. So I will conclude this presentation um, by saying that I wrote, I wrote this paper and I am still pursuing my PhD research in the aim of working with policymakers, prevention centers and organizations dealing with drug use and abuse, specifically with young people. And I want to work closely with places that are trying to find solutions and to bring more awareness to and about young people with their drug use and avoid demonization and help building a relationship of trust between governments and their citizens as hedonistic as their behaviors could be. And uh, I will uh, close this, um, this presentation with a quote of one of the participants, which I thought even trivial was still quite positive. Socially, it's been good. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sophia. And thank you for, for keeping on time. Uh, thanks a lot. Your presentation was really, really interesting about um, some illegal processes that that we don't we don't see, all the discourses that are created and this issue of, of drug consumption. Um, I have, well, a lot of, of ideas, but let's hope that all the the colleagues bring more information and then we'll have uh, a better discussion about it and you put it uh, very well the, the questions about the future so i would like please to ask marcos de Góes from federal university of rio de janeiro to to share your your screen and start your your presentation please okay João. olá boa tarde Can you all see it? Yes, yes, Mark, yes. we all see it. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. And I would like to start by thanking the event organizers for taking forward the idea of an uh, online experience yeah. <laughs> amid this, the various restriction on circulation that is still occur worldwide. But I think in Rio, we, we kind of live in this severe representation of uh, restriction to circulate. And I believe my presentation addresses the same problem. Meeting people at social events during the pandemic. In my specific case, there, these are events that occur at night and how they have been debated by the population. And in fact, I'm going to address the public debate on the ban but I'm, 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 I would like to show you some image of nighttime leisure. 
and <clears throat> um, and it, it's about, of course, in the city of Rio in Brazil. And by my presentation includes two phases of research on the nightlife in the city of Rio. The first and oldest one derived from my studies on the practices of nocturnal leisure between 2010 and 2015. And the second one, and most recent, is the includes research on social distance and impact impacts of on social life and all this context of um, of the pandemic so what i'm going to present is just a part of my um of my research in which i observe how the debate about the closing of economic activities was framed by the media through images and this is ongoing research so <laughs> the results are provisional. And, and so before going on and talking about the closures during the pandemic, it's relevant to say a, a few words about nightlife in Rio before the pandemic. There are three factors that are important. First, uh, it's the nighttime leisure take places uh, mostly on the streets, sidewalks and public spaces of the city. Second, uh, is that there are many nightlife centers in the city of Rio and some with metropolitan scale, which involves a large movement of people at night on weekends, especially on weekends. And finally, live music, artistic performances and customer service are very present, existent in the, all these centers. And the night economy brings together many works on a daily basis at night. So the use of a, a, a city, uh, city's public spaces at night varies greatly from place to place, but it's a very relevant aspect of people, uh, people's night out in Rio. I'll talk, our problem is with violence, public transportation and social inequality, which I will address for the, on the presentation. And the, uh, the spread of the SARS-CoV-2 virus from the last week of February in Brazil caused a significant change in this previous situation that I just showed you. And night activities have become uh, uh, one of the most relevant objects of public interest in the execution of social distance measures. So several social and actors were invited to talk about the issue and the local government was asked to respond with the new legal acts. Controlling the pandemic uh, has become a, a public issue in the sense used by Joseph Gus, uh, Gusfield, for example. And as Daniel Sefai says, um, a problematic situation becomes a public problem when its organization definition and evaluation become institutionally mediated. And that's the case of social distance in Rio, and I think it's in, in most of countries around the world. And the case uh, of nocturnal leisure, that is, is an adjustment of practice, practice meanings previous, previously seen as socially and economical and desirable to practices understood as harmful to the population's health. So you have, changing the, the way people understand nightlife. And among the various measures to contain the spread of the coronavirus, the most important was associated with the creation of golden rules for closing and then beginning for the reopening of the economy in June the, uh, of the last, uh, in the last year. Uh, from June onward, what is observed is the tension show in the media narratives about the reopening plan and the persistent actions to contain behavior considered transgressive by inspector and police officers. And of course, youth as well uh, become part of these ob observations. And tra traditional media was intensively involved in journalistic coverage of law enforcement and population reaction to them. They organized the information through text and image using graphics to represent pandemic effects on economy or photographs to portray daily, daily life. So today I will only present the analysis of photos that presented the pandemic 
problem for the nightlife situation within photos where uh, that that were found in on online newspapers with high ratings in the city. So to understand and interpret journalistic images, we rely on um, first on the discussion brought by Robert Entman about the framing of things by the media. In this case, framing refers to the ways in which the press organizes, situates, and transmits information or debates of public interest to of public interest to its audience, of course. And images in particular have this ability to produce meanings and reveal values about things. And I think it, it's very important to find a methodological scheme to understand this. And I'm using uh, a, a strategy, a methodology uh, used by Paulo Gomes to analyze images from the description and interpretation of the compositions that is structured scenarios. And this word scenario express the character of intentionally, intentionality related to the, to the act of framing a scene, make it a synthesis of a speech, a way of narrating a public problem. And finally, we understand that the process of narrative production through images is intrinsically <laughs> related to the place that images represents. So we are looking for position space, composition of, uh, of elements, and also the, the, uh, which places are um, exposed in these photos. For today's presentation, I'm using a sample of the 112 photographs that were analyzed and classified in the survey. And I use four frames to discuss the images. Emptiness, bubbles, playpen, and vests. So I will start with emptiness. Uh, uh, and I will start with the nightlife footage from the first days of the pandemic. This is the starting point for the closing of night activities. Since then, the city is directly affecting its daily organization. And we can begin to see images of empty streets and the population adaptation to the new context. So nightlife appears in the journalistic narratives based on images of empty spaces, closed nightclubs, and streets without people. So elements uh, which are spatially oriented and articulated with an idea of a social order. Sorry for that. Um, so this kind of social order through a scene from images you can see uh, in the image that I'm showing to you. And at this time, bars, restaurants, nightclubs have limited use and only activities considered essential could be open, like markets, pharmacies, and everything else. In some images, we can see the choice of presenting places from the ground floor or from the angle of a passerby. And from these angles, uh, the observer is included in space and becomes a witness to the emptying of places. And these are famous nightlife spots in Rio, areas usually occupied by customers on weekends and nights. So the image aimed to present the contrast, I think, uh, between the past and the effect of the pandemic on the city, city's social life. And there is no sociability, there is no nightlife on offer in these images. And nightlife begins to fade and empresarios begins to express concern for the future and press the local government to act for the reopening of real nightlife. And this is a, a good discussion. And the, the images that uh, uh, represent night spaces in the spirit show the confinement of nightlife to private space, like the Zoom meetings as this one we are right now. <laughs> and, this, um, and the houses undergoing a uh, reconfiguration in its forms of use becoming a space for nocturnal leisure, mediated through virtual screens in online conference rooms and artistic presentations that we also call it lives, live shows. And like the, the working life and that has changed to the home office, the nightlife has adapted to the house party as, as, uh, as well. And one of the key initiatives showed by online press was the creation of sociability bubbles. And in addition to the social bubbles, this common to studies of contemporary life and the attachment to a social network, which had been amplified 
during the pandemic, bubbles became part of the nightlife, this new kind of nightlife in a concrete way. And the media presented the innovations with relative enthusiasm as a way of adapting to new times of the pandemic, of post-pandemic. I don't think we are already in this stage of post-pandemic, but okay. The encapsulation of customers, workers, musicians in plastic covers reveals the, this, this dramatic moment and the presentation of the public problem of crowding, of getting together and direct physical, physical contact between people. So adherence to the rules, even if improvised, appears with a sense of hope, but uh, this is the beginning of the reopening. We can see that we have uh, different strategies to the reopening. And the second one I should call the playpens. And similar, similarly, um, business owners have adopted fences in small territories ex exclusively for nightly parties. So such measures appear from the reopening in June, June of 2000. 20 and spread throughout the year. So this moment also inaugurates a transformation in the frame of the problem by the press. Images begin to frame a, pro a process of returning to these spaces based on these new security protocols. And it can also be seen how this resumption of the activities and the institution of the new normal takes place from a physical reconfiguration of space. And the image of geometrically designed spaces represent a desired order for social encounter and consumption in this, in this case. And the play pain created for the first authorized parties and concerts are represented by the media, the new normal nightlife. And you also think about carnival right now in Rio. So this kind of nighttime leisure where each group can interact with, the, with his friends or family, but without direct contact with other people's play pen. And this is interesting because you also have this recovery of old drive-ins ideas of uh, organizing um, movie sessions in the parking lots and etc. And it's precisely when the reconfiguration of these scenarios becomes visible, the, the image seems to convey a sense of greater health security regarding the activity represented. It, so it becomes the future. Uh, as you, you can see. And the last one, the vest, because this is a really important image that also appeared in the, in, in the news. And, and as already mentioned, the media used the image of crowd environments, especially at night, to build a narrative of disobedience to the law and increasing risks of contagion. And once again, reinforcing the imagining of this, the night as a typical moment of transgression. transgression. <clears throat> And the image also allows us to no notice the recurrent presence of public security agents and health surveillance officials. It, we can see the foreground, the presence of the blue and black vests. And the, pains, the presence of public agents contrasts with the sociability rights developed in these spaces and begin to express an idea of opposition to the party, as you can see in the background. So the young audience to these parties compose the background of the photographs in agglomerations and situations of social interaction. And the narrative presented as transgressions, even though defined as a private to the owners, but the usual narrative it says that the old nocturnal normality became a risk and the old nightlife can be seen as an act against public health. So the party is over and it's all too risky to, to go red with them. So just to, I would like to close and my presentation with two images and some data that demonstrates the social inequality relighted during the pandemic, and they're also exposed by the media. And the exposure of the public problem triggered by the pandemic uses nocturnal activities as examples, presented the night as a period of instability, sometimes using daytime activity as an element of comparison in the construction of a narrative of contrast. And it's a, it's a discursive strategy. But it's interesting to us to think that framing the debate, uh, the framing of the debate by the media involves the, in the, 
the enhance, enhancement of cultures during the pandemic. It reveals deep social spatial inequalities with regard to mobility, access to public health service, the power to choose work and leisure routines and the sociability options available. So the night is a period that was framed by the media to demonstrate this social tension. While the public transportation became space of sociability and social tension during the pandemic. So the question is, who can isolate themselves during the pandemic? Who had to work and social distance for whom? Is the, I think it's a, a great question that we should address today. So just to finish with uh, some data that I always show you because it's a, a update right now while we're living in the city of Rio de Janeiro. And uh, you can see the clubs remain closed, but there are more and more cases of clandestine parties in the city. Bars and restaurants operate with measures of social distance, but hours um, are reduced and people are still afraid to go out and spend too much time away from home. And vaccination has helped to reduce cases and deaths, but confusion among government entities has um, helped to the lack of communication with the population. So, however, the alternatives presented have been aimed at a restricted public and forms of private sociability that are not very inclusive. So experience shows that this form of sociability tends to wear out very quickly, I think so. So thanks so much, that's all. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Marcos, for your your great presentation about uh, territory and um, an urban and, as you said, the metropolitan area that is before the pandemic was so so marked by social and special inequalities, as you said, and how the the pandemic has brought these these questions further and how we can see through the images and and your work is is very interesting how we can see about. Uh, and now having the, the images, how we can see uh, the golden rules, the narrative production, uh, the idea of social inequalities and the type of repression. And, and a question that, uh, that, well, it's all on my mind, uh, how it will be this carnival uh, in Rio de Janeiro that is a uh, very cultural and social uh, and even national uh, happening in, in all Brazil, but particularly in Rio de Janeiro that is so important in case of uh, of cultural uh, study or analysis. Let's see what will happen, and maybe you can give us a little bit more information about it uh, on the discussion. I would ask please to Elvin Khan from University of Westminster to to share um, their screen and to, and make his presentation. Hi, Elvin. Hi. Can you um, see the screen? Yes, we can see your screen. You can continue. Okay, sorry. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Elvan. Uh, I'm a PhD um, candidate from University of Westminster, Sociology Department. Um, this paper, Just Coffee, is actually, um, uh, I influenced uh, it's from my PhD fieldwork that I conducted on three different neighborhoods in Istanbul, uh, which lasted about three months. Um, Actually, my PhD is focusing on urban transformation in Istanbul and its impacts, its various impacts on public space and public space use and the loss of public space. And uh, this neighborhood, Balat, um, was a slightly um, different one and um, in terms of being more post-secular and more um, conservative. And it's influenced me to write uh, different papers and to give me a different aspect. Uh, perspectives. So um, before introducing um, the case of Palat, I'd like to uh, talk a bit about urban transformation in Istanbul. Uh, the current government in Istanbul that is in power, that was elected in 2002, uh, started a very ambitious urban renewal program with the aim of redeveloping almost the entire housing stock in Istanbul, which was about 1 million buildings in total. And to be able to do that, uh, they, have uh, they have implanted six uh, urban laws um, between 2004 and 2012. And the reason I'm, I'm, I'm explaining that because without of these urban laws, none of this um, transformation would have happened in Istanbul. 
and Balat wouldn't be transforming the way it did. So um, it, after a while with the new uh, laws, uh, not only housing, but um, historic and declined inner city neighborhoods started to transform as well, as well as the rest of the city. And mostly these transformations mostly resulted in gentrification. And in terms of Balat, which is one of the oldest, um, most traditional um, conservative uh, neighborhoods in Istanbul, uh, which is quite low income um, and still is very low income, uh, has always had a diverse background, still is very diverse, um, and also uh, had this beautiful historical architectural character. And its current transformation can be explained as culture led, um, which is, uh, we can say that the area was rediscovered by members of the creative class in the recent years. Uh, but um, it hasn't always been the case for Balad. Balad's transformation actually gained speed after 2005. It was uh, selected for another uh, urban transformation project that was initiated by the government itself to change the housing, to, not the change, but to renew the housing stock and um, potentially displace the locals and um, rent the area or sell the properties in a higher price. But this project was halted and cancelled um, as a result of uh, resistance amongst the locals. And in the end, Balat has uh, transformed in a different direction and its transformation has become completely culture-led. So um, um, why Balat? Um, well, because the area is um, almost in the heart of the city. It has a very good location, inner city location, affordable rent, and the idea of living and working uh, 100-year-old buildings has encouraged the creative class to relocate the area. It's uh, very different. It's very unique. Um, and new shops and cafes and eateries start to make the area even more popular amongst um, tourists, hipsters, students. Um, there was an overall theme of nostalgia due to the historical architecture, near Bohemia. And... Um, it has started to become a very uh, popular area and people start to go visit Balad for that for a day out. But um, what about the post-secularism? What about uh, alcohol consumption? And what about nighttime, uh, which is the actual focus of this paper? Um, I'd like to, first of all, say that alcohol consumption is a very important indicator in Turkey uh, to understand uh, a neighborhood, um, alcohol license, public drinking, to be able to buy alcohol. These are uh, the little things that give away the social and political tendency of an area. And you would understand if an area is more secular, more past secular, more religious through these little uh, practices. And post secular patterns impact, impact nighttime. Uh, and it can be in the shape of controlling, regulating, and limiting access to alcohol. So you don't have these controls and limits uh, in every neighborhood, but you can in certain neighborhoods, in certain cities in Turkey, even you wouldn't be able to find a shop to buy alcohol. And in certain areas, it wouldn't be the case. However, uh, with the current government's um, uh, interest in uh, shifting towards a more post-secular structure, there was another law that was put in place uh, in 2013 that uh, bans the purchase of alcohol from any shop between 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. That changed uh, uh, um, activities traditionally associated with the nighttime um, in Turkey and especially in Istanbul, which is similar to Western practices. Nighttime in Istanbul is also uh, deeply associated with um, purchasing alcohol, alcohol consumption, easy access. And this was challenged with this law. Um, after this, um, let's go back to Balat again. Uh, and in Balat, um, even though the area was gentrifying and the lifestyle was changing with new people moving in, the inhabitants are still mostly religious and they were still mostly very um, conservative. So the activities and the forms of consumption that can uh, happen, um, it could has to happen uh, with the neighborhood's conservative and Islamist majority. It had to align um, with the inhabitants' um, lifestyle. And 
despite the gentrification that's happening, uh, the forms of consumption are still very limited. And as a result, that was my uh, observation during the field work, the creative class um, were de-secularizing their businesses. And that would mean choosing not to serve alcohol, not to apply for alcohol license, not to sell it in their shops, and or closing their businesses before 10 p.m. in order to avoid uh, any type of nocturnal tension so that the air making sure the neighborhood is alcohol free um, and making sure there is no uh, nighttime activity. Um, so the neighborhood after a certain time would just be empty. So this non-existence of nighttime activity and non-existence of alcohol consumption was functioning like a curfew. And um, it was a very clear boundary between the daytime activities and nighttime activities in Wallet, this uh, regulation. So um, then what is it there to do in Wallet? What is left that we can do? Um, I was wondering that in uh, during my field work as well. And then I realized this um, increasing popularity of uh, coffee shops. Um, just coffee, you can just have coffee everywhere all the time. Uh, and um, it's important to uh, introduce that the life in Balat is actually built around coffee. And it's for everyone, not just for the creative class, it's for the locals, it's for the tourists, it's for students, hipsters. Anyone who can come to Balat would have coffee. But um, it was different coffee uh, for different communities, different coffee culture for different groups. Um, there were kahves, um, which I'm going to introduce, and there were third wave coffee shops. Kahve uh, means, literally means, it's a Turkish word, literally means coffee, is um, used to describe these local coffee shops that are in uh, mostly in low income areas for unemployed working class men um, to socialize. You can uh, imagine them as uh, social, little social clubs for uh, men, and they're not gender specific by law but uh, they're traditionally known to serve my male customers only. And when I was uh, in Balat doing the field work, I didn't go into these cafes because it doesn't feel right to just walk into these places. They're very, uh, much, um, very much gendered. And then uh, there were third way coffee shops. They were the newcomers. They were reshaping the traditional coffee culture that was already in the neighborhood by just opening up again, fitting in, to this area um, and introducing just a more hipster, more middle-class third wave coffee shops for tourists, hipsters, the, the new people flooding into the neighborhood. And these places obviously were not gender specific, but they were very much class-based because not everyone can go and get a coffee in a middle-class uh, coffee shop. They were much more expensive than the traditional coffee shops. So they were not really for the locals of Balad, they were for the newcomers. Um, um, and um, that brings me to my uh, concluding uh, uh, remarks. So um, cultural-led gentrification has made Balad, uh, has changed Balad, but Balad's managed to preserve its traditional and conservative fabric. But uh, there was a new uh, form of consumerism that is, um, uh, shaped. However, um, nighttime activities that might contain alcohol consumptions were deliberately ignored in order, in order to avoid any form of uh, nocturnal tension. I'd like to uh, uh, say here that this, these situations happened in some neighborhoods in Turkey before, where the neighborhood was a bit more conservative and new art galleries opened up. There were lots of nocturnal tensions that ended up in uh, fights or violence, and I think this is why the creative class in Balat are being more careful because they want to stay in that neighborhood and they want to live there. So they are deliberately uh, ignoring to have any sort of problems with the, with the locals. And gentrification here is also linked to uh, commercialization like in the Western models, but it also has to go, uh, has to align with the government's ideology, uh, which is more, uh, conservative Islamist. And uh, while in some cities and in some neighborhoods of Istanbul, nightlife is still spills out on the street, 
and this is the case in more secular neighborhoods in Istanbul now. Here we are seeing nightlife retreating more into indoor spaces. And this indicates a different um, difference with the Western model uh, of gentrification and nightlife, um, it, which is much more regulated and reflect uh, Islamic tendencies. So before I, uh, I finish, um, I'd like to show you some visuals from my field work. These are the new coffee shops that's opened up, as you can see, uh, third wave coffee shops with um, English names mostly, uh, trying to attract tourists and hipsters and the creative class. And these are the original uh, cafes, which as you can see, they were there for probably hundreds of years. And as you can see, the customers are entirely um, older men. Um, thank you very much. Now for listening to my presentation. Thank you so much, Helvan. Very, very, very interesting uh, presentation about uh, well, a, a, a space that we it's not common to to hear about gentrification and and about a creative class and a, a, a very interesting um, context between the, the the east and the west uh, here here on on, on Europe. And, and for sure, a debate that started before the pandemic, the, how far gentrification is going, if we are in the stage of early long-term uh, gentrification. And, and for sure, um, we, I uh, speak for, for myself, we are so used to, to see the models from, as you said, uh, fueled uh, uh, alcohol gentrification. That is very, well, uh, uh, unusual to see these processes occurring in, 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 in contexts that the alcohol has been changing. And, uh, and that was one of my questions that I wanted to, 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 to make you because I'm very curious about it. But let's see what, what the discussion will, will bring. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, now, I would like, please, to Jose Larache uh, from Universita Nacional del Sur uh, to make this presentation and share um, their uh, their screen, please. Okay, thank you. We are seeing your presentation. Okay, um, hi. Um, my name is Jose. I'm from Argentina. And I'm part of the Departamento de Geografía y Turismo, as I am PhD in Geography candidate. And I'm also a member of the National Research Council of Argentina, Paul Conicet. And this uh, intervention, it's um, a kind of exploration um, that derives from a more specific topic that structures uh, the current doctoral thesis and that is related to the construction of LGBT spaces where the night indeed occupies a central place. At this point, uh, from these territories, I began to, to note that nightlife had been a very little study dimension over time in Latin America as a factor to understand urban dynamics and societies according to their scale. Uh, in Argentina, for example, the pioneers and almost unique works uh, in this line are those of the group of Dr. Margulis, uh, who was in charge of sociology of culture in Universidad de Buenos Aires. But then you have almost nothing uh, around nightlife, night dynamics in Argentina, according to academic field. Therefore, the objective of this work is to analyze the nightlife offer as another point to understand differences uh, between cities in this uh, um, scale game. Uh, I, I'm a geographer, so this uh, scale game is important for me, uh, uh, between metropolitan and non-metropolitan spaces. Um, this better start from a cultural perspective, I'm a cultural geographer that considers time connected with space and uh, conceives space as a social and symbolic uh, dimension. So uh, let's start. Now. 
Okay, some starting considerations about Argentina nightlife. Uh, as you might know, uh, Argentina stands out internationally for its nightlife, although uh, it is all also recognized by its scenic and natural attractions, uh, mainly in the touristic market, in the international touristic market. Uh, in this sense, I, I attach a, a, a little map where you can see this uh, corridor, uh, let's say Buenos Aires, Rosario and Cordoba, that contains the main three cities of Argentina, the millionaires ones and the more metropolitan ones. So it seems important for me to understand that this corridor between Buenos Aires, Rosario and Cordoba are where the more in, you, have, uh, you, you can find the, the strong night in, in the country. Um, and here in in the south, you, you have Bahia Blanca, the city that I, I will, I'm from, to to compare then the the nightlife offer. So um, Cordoba, Rosario, and Buenos Aires offer the most priced recreational scenes due to their intensity from Monday to Monday, let's say, variety and duration. And it is interesting to highlight the contrast that exists with other major cities in the world, such as Paris, where I lived, or, uh, well, Bar Barsava, where I live also, uh, that you have the strong nights. Uh, it's extended, let's say, until 2 or 3 a.m. And then, in general, places began to get empty. Uh, in the case of, of this uh, Argentina city, it's also imperative to highlight uh, the relationship that exists between nightlife and the conception of drugs and other substances that led to situation of fighting and violence that are much more frequent than in other uh, cities uh, in the global north. Likewise, nighttime consumption can be divided into three phases in, in the Argentinian urban centers. We have the first phase we call previa or previa, and it goes from 11 or 12 uh, p.m. to 2 a.m., and where you usually drink just to, to get relaxed. Then we have the strong night phase or, noche, or la noche fuerte, uh, and it is uh, extended from 2 to 6 a.m., and the late or the the ultimate phase is the after, that it's extended uh, to 10 or 11 a.m. Yeah, during daylight. And this is a very interesting point because night and day uh, become, uh, become uh, linked and the dynamics uh, suffer a, a sort of encounter. Uh, these contrasts are more felt in medium-sized cities where uh, well, people used to uh, have less articulation channels. Uh, for example, in Bahia Blanca, we don't have metros, so uh, people from night or day to go work or to return from night uh, clubs uh, tend to use the same public transport. So this is interesting to say. So. According to this starting consideration, what happens with night leisure in the rest cities of the country beyond this uh, corridor uh, with Rosario, Cordoba, Buenos Aires, how is ludic offer in non-metropolitan scales such as Bahia Blanca and what are the effects in the community night sense of belonging and the diversity? So this is a connector, yeah? Um, the main connector of this intervention, I think it's interesting to, to notice that night diversity also talks about cities and, and their uh, dynamics. So uh, I, I take into account uh, all, not all the space dedicated to nightlife. We are all inter we are only interested in that uh, which concentrate the strong night, la noche fuerte. Uh, that is associated with entertainment, dancing, conception of alcoholic beverage, and mainly the sociability crossed by music. 
uh, in this way, um, we have to pay attention to the red uh, issues there in the screen and other spatial typologies that have less extension in the night, in the nighttime, such as restaurants and cafes, and that respond to more limited social practices uh, are left out. Yeah, for example, uh, the ones uh, like restaurants or cafes, you go there to eat, to drink, or to interact with your direct group, with your direct social group, but then in the La Noche Fuerte spaces, you can interact with uh, strangers. So that makes me more uh, interest about. The same happens with cinema, theaters, and other shows where mainly people observe, but not interact. Um, however, it's, it is necessary to highlight that uh, these kind of spa spaces have more heterogeneous offer than the one in question because theaters, you have in, in Argentina a lot of cultural uh, movements with traditional under theaters, the same as cinemas. And uh, I have a problem with this nightclubs consideration because when you translate nightclubs to Spanish, it's not the same as in the global north. Nightclub for us, it's a place where you uh, see girls dancing, or you can pay for sex, so this nightclub is a, a problem in the translation. Uh, so um, I, I, did, I did not consider it because in Argentina are forbidden, yes? Um, then um, in addition to the practices, there are difference also between these spaces uh, in arrangement, in the order of the space, and in their location that we find interesting to discuss. While a pub or a bar in Argentina tend to be smaller than a disco, they are also usually located in central areas and not in the periphery like discos. Um, and finally, uh, it is essential to mention that before the pandemic, um, there have been a, a certain crisis uh, in the, the spread of this uh, night leisure possibilities in the Buenos Aires territory in general, especially discos, uh, due to the boom in breweries, yes? Uh, spaces uh, that tend to be more relaxed, socially relaxed, although they do not allow the deployment that the disco allows. This trend uh, was exacerbated in intermediate spaces such as Bahia Blanca, where several night owners close and other turn breweries into pseudo discos. Yeah? It, uh, breweries in Argentina tend to combine uh, the intimacy of the bar and the anonymity of the discotheque after 2 a.m. Breweries are like uh, our discos today. Um, so, according to time, it's important to, to say that we have an evolution in this space, uh, the night leisure, space typologies in time. During 80s and 90s, pubs and bars were popular in Argentina, but oriented to different people according to social class and gender. While the first, I mean pubs, uh, are, were focused on a more distinguished consumption of drinks and a mixed social scene, the bars that today are called notable bars for its story mark were the favorite meeting point of masculinity, uh, where the same was uh, always consumed, like the, um, the whiskerias that Michael Spenu told us about uh, in the first uh, time. Today, part of these bars incorporate billiards and television to be, able, to be able to watch football, but they do not modify their barrel composition. And then with the cultural globalization, video clips, choreographies, and the fascination for styling and aesthetics appear, and we have a consolidation in Argentina in the new millennium. 
uh, the irradiation of music channels and radio charts that soon make discotheques a material expression of import music that was fashionable in the, Nova, in the global north, collaborate with this. Soon, this nocturnal space uh, called discos uh, start to be popular in Buenos Aires and start to import also the aesthetic uh, architecture like you might know, uh, like you might see in this pacha disco in the image. <clears throat> and also electronic appears with that, with disco, and little by little differences in conception by styles will be delineated. Um, and the security personnel appear for the first time in nightlife, yeah, with discos. At the entrance and the problem with the right of admission and uh, yeah, the racial and ethnic uh, consideration in this uh, specific spaces. Late in the 21st century, the brewery as a new night format begins to attract the attention of the youngest. Uh, it was a risky bet in a country that you may know, um, the production of wine is very famous. And despite the fact that uh, wine is mainly consumed by people over 40 years old. Soon the variety of flavors and social climate of the breweries with open spaces um, began to have an overwhelming success. So much so that each Argentina region has its distinctive beer that allows nighttime conception in almost the entire national territory. Today, the brewery phenomenon is still in force, and in fact, due to, the, to this difference in having open spaces areas, breweries were the only ones to be open during this uh, pandemic, so all uh, collaborated to uh, increase this uh, mode of the breweries. Now, um, how we can translate all this information to the case that concern us? Well, uh, we have um, a map of Bahia Blanca and it's, it's important that uh, beyond being a researcher of the night, I consider myself a night consumer. So at this plan since I entered, to nightlife, I have been able to detect changes, changes in the cartographies of the city and simplifications in the offer from 2010 to nowadays. Um, before 2010, we have a difference, differentiated areas, yeah, uh, where in the central area we have uh, pubs and bars mainly. And the discotheques were in Fuerte Argentino Avenue or outside yeah, the main core of the city. Uh, but then with uh, this crisis and the improvement of brewery, this has uh, radically changed by the imposition of uh, Chuchings in, in uh, Alem Avenue, yeah, the, the mark uh, you have in red. The first thing is fashion, uh, the imperative to do what the majority do. Uh, Bahia Blanca is a city uh, which all, always observe Buenos Aires uh, night life. So uh, fashion is one factor uh, to simplify, simplify night life offer. And then the, the youth dictatorship as young people seem to be the only users of the night in Bahia Blanca, something that has to do with the type of the city, yeah? Uh, for example, medium-sized city, uh, for all people, you, you might not see all people, all people in nightlife, uh, in a strong nightlife. As can be seen briefly in the map of the city, we have these three uh, areas. But nowadays we only have one in, in, in intense use, yeah, with the breweries. Well, it's interesting uh, to analyze um, the proximity in this area with a student neighborhood 
also that it's important to consider and um, the uh, facility in in the investments for brewery for stakeholders yeah in breweries you all, you only drink some beer you young young people tend to be there because you have happy hours you eat for a cheap price only pizzas or tapas and you have no more um, ex expensive investments in other issues than this goes that is more bigger um, so in general you don't involve large investments and and i would look to i would like to highlight the the invitation of cultural local artists also in breweries that you might not have in discos or in pubs before but also it's oriented to young uh, cultural artists not uh, the, the experienced one um, so the difficulties in the coexistence of nightlife spaces are directly linked to the size and morality of the city in question uh, the weight of, of Buenos Aires and the large Latin American cities in cultural matters responds to a combination of symbolic, demographic, uh, and touristic function. Uh, Bahia Blanca is an intermediate city with only 300 miles inhabitant that does not report interest for tourism. However, it is a city with an interesting cultural offer that does not translate into nightlife. In this segment, a competitiveness within homogeneity and stand, stand out since the breweries compete with each other due to, to the strong implication that passions have in a city that historically uh, looked at what is happening in Buenos Aires and so to in, imitate their products. As a result, we can see that all people has no place to go to dance. Electronic fans or techno fans have to wait for special occasions or must travel to the metropolis, to Buenos Aires. And the nostalgic groups, we can see pop or traditional or cumbia, uh, have to create their own alternative night possibilities in particular houses far from public sphere. Uh, this leads to an alarming simplification of an almost unique time space to be able to display creativity and innovation hand in hand with the diversity of preferences. So to conclude, um, let's say homogeneous, homogenization because of young people as only users and simplification uh, like breweries as the star format uh, led, um, yeah, of night leisure are the main features of Bahia Blanca night comparing with metropolitan spaces. Pubs disappear, bars tend to reduce in number and be in the margins, and discos are close to extinction. Uh, people um, that have more than 35 years old is reduced uh, to night spaces with Quiet, quieter practices or who require experience such as cafes and restaurants, theaters and cinemas, but are not welcome into the strong night. LGBT, electronic fans and other urban groups have to wait to a specific events or go to Buenos Aires to enjoy night according to their preferences. And brewery seems to be the only successful and viable format as we can see. Uh, well, with this Jose, intervention... I'm so sorry. Please, yeah. please end your presentation. Yes, it's please. the last. Yeah, it's the last. Uh, it's interesting to, to delve that into singularities of nightlife to understand its importance in the search for a diverse urban offer, yeah? Not only between metropolitan and non-metropolitan, but also between north and global south. We have a specific uh, nightlife typologies, yeah? We, we, we will see and the challenge the challenge is not to minimize the role of nightlife in the social vitality of cities especially in argentina where the night is an added value itself and here we have presented a brief overview 
Sorry. 